over the past few years, I have become increasingly aware, and my guess is that many of you also have, at how the digital technology we're talking about often imperceptibly, possibly inadvertently, and increasingly deeply has encroached on the rhythms of our lives. Not, not something necessarily people were thinking about in terms of what it would do to those rhythms. And so tonight, um, I'd like to talk about how we might reverse that trend, especially with regard to, to mental health, and uh, how we might look at uh, ways to empower people, um, how we're beginning to look at ways to nourish people at, at times of, of metamorphosis. If you think about it, and sometimes we just don't even go into anything but denial, um, you'll realize we are living in a very surreal world. <laughs> All of a sudden, we are living in a very surreal world um, where um, too often, even though we are swimming in all of these apps that are supposed to connect us, we feel really alone. And not only alone, but it's almost as if we're drifting somewhere between the old physical world and the new digital world. And we haven't just figured out how that's, how that's all, all going, to, going to fit. Also, it's a world where um, being with those that we care about, um, really truly being with them is in a strange way becoming an endangered experience. But on top of that, and I think really importantly on top of that, um, there's something else going on that I think people are beginning to get some awareness of, but all this time, data is being vacuumed up from us about what actions we're doing, about how we're going about our lives, and that vacuum data is going up into large technology uh, companies. I won't call out Facebook, but you can imagine it might, might be up there some, some, somewhere. Um, but um, the, the important thing is that there's a continuous chance to decode um, our ways, and this is how people are being manipulated, and it's, I think, aptly now being called, we're being hacked. And so that, that's one sort of way of thinking of where the world's going to go. Now, over the last couple of decades, as was mentioned several times before, good news is that in neurosciences, in mental health, there are extraordinary insights in terms of how our brains are wired, what's going on in our, in our mind, what's happening uh, in, in our behavior, that actually have this opportunity to actually be used um, in a positive sense, in, in a way that, that might be able to help us. So what we're, we've been thinking about is let's pause and consider a world where we got to choose how we want to live in it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow have something that I'm gonna term a personal health assistant, so our personal health assistant. And it would be one, I think, um, that would allow us to understand ourselves, that would be a vehicle by which we could understand ourselves, that it would be one that provided a freedom to act with more certainty, it would be one that said, wouldn't it be great if, instead of necessarily going to the NHS, maybe there was a way to self-navigate among lifestyles, choices about will I meditate, choices about nutrition, et cetera, before symptoms arise? Because we think that is where you could be able to have the most impact. It's, it's a device where you wish you could nurture um, our actions in times of strength. And most importantly, this can't be something that's done for you. We strongly think that if you were going to build something, it has to be done by each other, for each other, contributed in a way where you felt, we all felt that we were building something for each other, and, of course, um, without people feeling as if they're, they're, they're being exploited. So about seven years ago, uh, we began working on efforts to take what normally happens in a clinician's office and say, why does that have to only occur in a clinician's office? A clinician has five senses. If we could take the sensors that were on phones and on other devices, we could begin to capture the data that's emanating from us all the time, and we could make it so people then had a chance to have that return of, of, of agency. And so by 2015, 
as uh, John Geddes mentioned, um, we'd gotten to the point where we were teaming up with, with Apple and looking at what you could do for various diseases where individuals, instead of giving a, report, a patient reported outcome, were actually saying, this is objectively what's going on within me and I'm, and I'm gonna be able to track it. So um, there were a cluster of initial uh, opportunities to be allow people to, to collect these, not centered around a particular university. I'm just gonna pick one example. I'm gonna pick an example of Parkinson's disease because we put a fair amount of effort into that. I'm just not gonna take the thousands of dimensions of data. I just wanna go into one dimension of data, one person. So this is a man with Parkinson's disease who over an uh, interval of four months, 120 days, we were able to track what their disease was like at a precise way before and after they took their L-DOPA, took their medicine. And what you'll notice is, look at the difference that's going on. So there are a bunch of yellow arrow up arrows where the drug is doing something. But notice that there are a bunch of days where actually the drug's doing very little, and there's some days where it's actually going down. And when we ask people why was that, what we found was that individuals basically said, I'm not feeling myself, or I'm feeling centered, I'm feeling supported, or the world is coming in on me. We got interested, that was changing the symptoms, not how they felt about their disease, but the actual symptoms of the disease were going on, um, depending upon sort of how those micro changes were happening in their environment. So going to current uh, efforts, um, over the past year and a half after having uh, come to Oxford, we're beginning to ask, could we build individual trajectory maps for individuals that would tell them what would happen to them in three weeks, in three months? Could we actually follow things with enough detail and know what was going on using machine learning, et cetera, and take those physiologic signals that we're getting off the devices and turn them into clinical symptoms that then we could follow? And so you may have guessed this is one condition, it's not a disease, but it's one that half the population experiences, which is pregnancy. And so this is an example of a project about to launch in New York with 1,000 women who are pregnant, following them for a year, going to all their clinic visits. But while they're going to their clinic visits, they have an app on their phone, collecting things from the phone. And we're also collecting things that are coming off a smart watch, off an aura ring, which I'm wearing, which I can tell you about later spectacular way to follow sleep and some other aspects. Um, a scale which doesn't just weigh you but gives you all these other um, dimensions. And imagine what we're doing is we're taking all this data feeding, coming in from these multiple dimensions and coming up and saying, oh, this is what's happening to this symptom or that symptom. Now where it became interesting and one of the reasons why I uh, decided I needed to be at Oxford in, uh, in John Getty's department was we also began to realize that we could follow the efferent pathways of the autonomic nervous system. That we could actually follow in real time, real time, continuous, what was happening to stress in individuals and how that was affecting their symptoms and what they were uh, going on to do. And so uh, the studies beyond pregnancy, we've moved into inflammatory bowel disease and we're looking at what can we f uh, forecast flares in inflammatory bowel disease. We're looking at diabetes and asking the transition from pre-diabetes to diabetes. Can we take lifestyle interventions? So one of the lifestyle interventions, exactly as Wilhelm was saying, is these people are meditating. So there's one group that's meditating, and we're looking, what happens when you meditate? How does that help the person? Exercise, nutrition. So we're trying to give that power back to, back to the individual. Now, Somewhere in, that, in the audience, there have to be a set of people that are going, what are you trying to do bringing agency back to people? That's really hard. Um, how do you know that people are going to be able to follow this? Stepping on a scale does not weight reduction make. We know that. There has to be something, has to be something about how that knowledge is, is given back. So the reason uh, I'm in the um, psych department is that we think that the art of being able to return agency will be about nurturing people in times of strength and giving them clues as to what they could do and having a community, not just a single individual, but imagine being able to reach out to a cluster of friends who care about what's going on. And so it's support and knowledge and trust and privacy that we do not think could happen on Facebook or other places. We just don't think you should have the 
uh, uh, the trust in, in those organizations. So now to the um, two projects that we're gearing up to do in the fall. When a freshman shows up at the university, they are suddenly smashed with all of these stressors and they're missing their childhood support systems. And in that situation where they're off the grid, it is no wonder that they're having a hard time in terms of trying to move through, through that academic light. So we are figuring out ways to use those tools on the phone, on wearables, figure out a way to um, put a, so those wearables on, but then build a community where individuals are saying, I could support you, here's what I found work, here's my data, here's my insight. So this is called participant-led research, where you ask people what they think might be able to work, you combine it with the artificial intelligence. So that's around academic-like. But the other um, thing that uh, I uh, have become interested in by a colleague who's here in London, who said, uh, she said, um, what about women going through menopause? Women going through menopause have no support structure about that. If anything, it's sort of like, I'm going to hide this. I'm not saying what happens to me. Whoa, this happened to my cognition, or this is happening to my sleep. And so we're looking to build up another community among health professionals, so women health professionals, who together are going to try to see if they could form a community to ask, what is it that may be able to give them um, their, their insights? So in closing, I think it's important to ask um, who, who can ask the right questions. Um, most companies, and I've been in some rather good ones, have, are extraordinarily stuffed with highly competent, talented people that are brilliant at doing work. But in those companies, the answer of you know, what is right has to go to the profit line, has to go to the product launch. It has to be what is it doing for that company. And I think there is a very important role for universities in looking at fundamental issues, looking at the things that could be those inadvertent consequences of the technology, looking at how it could be helpful to people. And, 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 and so I think there's an extraordinary opportunity. So this is the last slide. This is a woodcut block that was to represent a medieval human leaving uh, medieval age into the age of reason. But I actually think it works rather well for us exiting the physical world and we're moving into a digital world. And I, th I think there is um, an opportunity as we're making this transition to look for programs where they are purposely pursuing how best to empower people, how to shift uh, people's lifestyles, and, and that those efforts are probably worth nurturing.